This episode is brought to you by Curiosity Box. Watch till the end for an unboxing and use our code FOSSIL for discounts and to support the channel. It's yeah. the body deck! The body. It's the one I wanted! <laughs> <laughs> It's so cool! Do you want to come over there? Come over The Carboniferous period of Earth's history represents an immense span of time in which all kinds of astounding evolutionary events occurred. Lasting from about 359 to 299 million years ago, this period saw the major dividing of the early land-living vertebrates into groups that would eventually become the reptiles and the mammals, as well as the continued diversification of the amphibians, as a whole host of extraordinary predators appeared. But the Carboniferous was not just an important time for those animals with a backbone, it was really a period that belonged to the invertebrates. Enormous millipedes scuttled their way through the undergrowth, bird-sized dragonfly relatives buzzed through the canopies, and for anyone with arachnophobia, this would probably be the last time period you'd ever want to visit if you were to suddenly come into possession of a time machine. An immense array of arachnid species have been found in rocks dating back to the Carboniferous, shedding light on the evolution of modern groups of these animals, and revealing the existence of various long-extinct types. This was a time when the arachnids were exploding in diversity and giving rise to a fascinating multitude of body plans that have not been seen since. So let's take a look at some of them, back when Earth was an arachnid's world. You may have heard before that the reason the arthropods, the grouping that includes arachnids, insects, crustaceans and many others, were so successful and grew to such large sizes in the Carboniferous was due to the higher percentage of oxygen in the atmosphere at this time, thus enabling the arthropods to get bigger as they could absorb more oxygen, despite having smaller surface area to volume ratios at their larger dimensions. However, this is actually somewhat of a debate among paleontologists. Like, well, most things are in paleontology. Studies that use different methods to calculate atmospheric oxygen percentage have come to varying conclusions about whether it was actually a great deal more than it is today. Some found that it was about the same or slightly lower than today, while others found it to be significantly above. So, the exact extent of oxygen's importance in the diversification and large body sizes of Carboniferous arthropods is not entirely clear. One group of arachnids that had already appeared by the Carboniferous and were continuing to do well were the scorpions. I'm talking here about the true scorpions, the ones that are still around today. Although the so-called sea scorpions, the extinct Eurypterids, were also having a good time in the Carboniferous, but they're not considered by most studies to be arachnids. The scorpions reached some pretty large sizes in the Carboniferous, with the species Pulmonoscorpius kirktonensis reaching an estimated 70 centimeters, or about 2.3 feet. Pulmonoscorpius is known from fossils found in Scotland that date to the early part of the Carboniferous period, but this actually wasn't the biggest that scorpions have ever got. Much earlier on in their evolution, during the preceding Devonian period, some even larger species existed, such as Brontoscorpio which might have grown up to 94 centimetres in total length, or about 3.1 feet. Still, Pulmonoscorpius would have been a formidable creature to come across. These were fully terrestrial animals, possessing book lungs adapted to efficiently exchange gases in the air with their many intricately folded plates to increase the surface area. They likely would have been predators of the other invertebrates, and potentially even the small vertebrates, that they shared their terrestrial environment with. They appear to have similar adaptations to the modern scorpion family Buthidae, which are active hunters with fairly thick tails and quite prominent stingers. Pulmonoscorpius doesn't show any indication that it would burrow, as many modern scorpions do, and it also had much larger compound eyes on the sides of its head segment compared to today's species. Coupled with the placement of the smaller middle eyes more towards the front of the head compared to modern scorpions, this would seem to indicate that vision was of great importance to Pulmonoscorpius. Since the reduced eyes in modern scorpions are part of their adaptations for nocturnal lifestyles, it appears that Pulmonoscorpius was active during the daytime, and was a vision-based hunter instead of relying mainly on sensing chemicals, pressure changes, vibrations, and other signals. Somewhat surprisingly, despite Pulmonoscorpius being quite well known in paleo media, making an appearance in Prehistoric Park, as well as also being featured in the video game Ark, not a great deal of research seems to have really been done on this particular species since it was described back in 1994. So if anyone's looking for a cool fossil scorpion themed research project, I'm sure there's lots more that could be learned from these animals. Spiders were one of the other major lineages of arachnids that originated in the Carboniferous, or possibly in the older Devonian period. The oldest spider fossil that we've discovered so far comes from a site in Ukraine, and dates to slightly more than 315 million years ago, in the late Carboniferous. These oldest of the spiders show many similarities to the very primitive spider suborder Mesothelae, 
which can still be found today in Asia. These ancient spiders were all still quite small though, and remained fairly small throughout the Carboniferous. The biggest extinct spider we've found is actually from the Jurassic period, with Mongolarachne jurassica at a body length of 24.6mm, and front legs measuring 56.6mm. However, that's still not as large as the living goliath birdie to tarantulas or the giant huntsman spiders, which can have leg spans reaching up to 300mm, almost a foot. So, you can take comfort in the fact that you are living at the same time as the largest spider species we currently know of. The exact details of spider origins are still rather unclear at the moment, since fossils of these animals are so rare, but hopefully more fossil finds will help to clarify them in the future. From what we can currently tell, it seems that the closest relatives of the spiders are members of an extinct group called Eurorhinaida, which appeared around 385 million years ago in the Devonian and lived through the entirety of the Carboniferous. These Eurorhinaids, like spiders, were capable of producing silk, as their fossils show that they had spigots, very small hair-like tubes that silk comes out of. However, they don't seem to have had spinnerets, which are abdominal appendages in spiders that allow them to better control the production of silk. So, instead of using their silk to create precise webs like many true spiders do, the Eurorhinaids might have been utilising this material for processes requiring less precision, such as wrapping up prey, making egg sacs, or lining their burrows. Another difference between modern spiders and the Eurorhinaids is that these prehistoric arachnids still had very long tail segments, or telsons. Idmon arachne, a species that lived about 305 million years ago and was found as fossils in France, is also not quite a spider but shows another step between the Eurorhinaids and the true spiders. It has an overall spider-like body without the extended telson, but also lacks spinnerets, so again it was probably not using silk for super precision purposes. This little guy was only about 10mm in length, or around 0.4 inches, but it does show how the general spider body plan evolved and in what order certain features appeared. Another extinct lineage of spider-adjacent arachnids is Trigonotarbida. Again, the Trigonotarbids are quite superficially spider-like, but they couldn't produce silk as they lacked both spigots and spinnerets. During the Carboniferous, these were some of the most abundant and diverse arachnids in the coal swamp environments of the time. However, they didn't last as long as the true spiders, dying out at some point in the following Permian period. Trigonotarbids are thought to have hunted and fed in a similar way to modern spiders, with fangs used to capture and subdue prey before they then excreted digestive enzymes onto their unlucky victims and sucked up the liquefied remains. Incredibly well-preserved fossils of Trigonotarbids from the older Devonian period even preserve the structure of their mouths, showing that they had many bristles lining the cavity to create a specialised filtering system that would stop any solid bits of their prey getting in and blocking their gut. These guys liked invertebrate smoothies only. Despite their rather fearsome up-close appearance, the Trigonotarbids were again quite small in size, reaching a maximum length of around 50mm, or nearly 2 inches. Compared to the older forms that lived in the Silurian and Devonian periods, which were some of the top predators of the first terrestrial ecosystems, the later Carboniferous Trigonotarbids were much more extensively armoured, with more complex exoskeletons and protective spines to help deter the new predators that were appearing, such as the earliest reptiles. The predation pressure from these animals and the competition with other arachnids such as the true spiders might have been the cause of their extinction in the end. Those exceptionally well-preserved Devonian specimens of Trigonotarbids I mentioned have even been used to reconstruct how these critters would have moved. Digital versions of them have been recreated in Blender to show how their legs would have articulated and thus how they walked. So you can actually watch videos of simulated Trigonotarbids scuttling about, which is pretty cool. With all these arachnids diversifying in the Carboniferous, there are also some species that scientists are still quite uncertain about what they actually are. These include species such as Plesiosyro, the only known member of an entire arachnid order called Haptopoda. This creature likely crawled about in very narrow spaces, with limbs suited to moving about in tight spots. It was probably a predator of smaller invertebrates, using the tooth-like projections on its upper limb segments to help process prey. Phalangiotarbids are another completely extinct order that includes quite a few species, but it's unclear what they actually are, and despite looking overall fairly spider-like, they might be closer related to harvest men or ticks. Another mystery arachnid was named in May of 2024, Douglas arachne acanthopoda, 
This beast was found in the Maison Creek fossil beds of Illinois, which date to the late Carboniferous some 309 million years ago. This thing has really stumped paleontologists, as it doesn't look quite like any other living or extinct arachnid order. It's got a flat, fairly wide body and quite robust legs that are absolutely covered in large spines. Clearly, old Douglas here was needing a lot of protection from other Carboniferous predators, and by the looks of it, they certainly wouldn't have been very pleasant things to eat. Hopefully, some more fossils of the species will be found from Maison Creek at some point, and we'll be able to figure out what it really is. I should also mention here the classic species that is always brought up in discussions of Carboniferous arachnids, the formidable Megarachne. Based on fossils found in Argentina, the name of this animal literally means giant spider, and indeed it was pretty enormous, with an estimated body length of 339 millimeters, more than a foot, which would make it the biggest spider that has ever lived. Unfortunately, or fortunately for arachnophobes, it was not a spider. Megarachne was realised in 2005 to actually be a sea scorpion, one of the extinct Eurypterids that I briefly mentioned earlier. The Eurypterids could grow to some pretty enormous sizes, with Jacalopterus in the Devonian period reaching up to 2.6 metres in length, or 8.5 feet. So, actually, Megarachne was on the smaller side for a sea scorpion. There are still lots of outdated models of Megarachne as a giant spider that can be found in various natural history museums around the world. I've come across a few myself, so now if you see one of these, you can be a really annoying nerd like me and point out the error to people. I'm sure they'll appreciate it. Various other lineages of arachnids that are still alive today were also chilling in the Carboniferous too. In addition to rather large true scorpions, the Carboniferous also saw the appearance of the Whip Scorpions, members of the arachnid order Europygi. These arachnids are named as such due to their superficial similarities to the scorpions, such as their raptorial forelimbs for tearing apart prey, but with the addition of very long and whip-like tails. However, they're actually more closely related to spiders than to scorpions. They're also known by the name vinegaroons, apparently because they can secrete a vinegar-like substance from glands at the base of their whip tails as a defense measure. Today, whip scorpions are found on almost every continent and mainly inhabit tropical regions. This worldwide distribution suggests that they likely originated before the supercontinent Pangaea broke up towards the end of the Triassic, and indeed, studies of their molecular evolution suggest that they appeared during the late Carboniferous. Fossils of these scorpion mimics are very, very rare, but some have been found dating to the Carboniferous period. One such species is the recently named Paralis Thelifonus bryante. That's a bit of a mouthful to say. This species was discovered in Massachusetts, and is currently the largest whip scorpion to have been discovered from the entire Paleozoic era, the era that lasted from 539 to about 252 million years ago. Paralis Thelifonus is a whopping 34 millimeters long, or 1.3 inches. Not quite the prehistoric giant you might have been expecting, and still smaller than some modern species, which can get up to almost 90 millimeters in length, 3.5 inches. But hey, they had to start somewhere. Plus, considering the extreme rarity of their fossils, it's still possible there were larger ones living back then. Paralis thelifonus is significant for reasons other than its size though. Its discovery in a rock formation representing what was once a wet lowland river system with lots of vegetation and peat formation supports the idea that whip scorpions originated in tropical environments, where they are still most commonly found today. In addition, the fact that this species lived more than 300 million years ago, and yet is still very recognisable as a whip scorpion, with all the key features of this group clearly visible, shows that these animals have experienced a degree of anatomical stasis over the course of their evolution, changing relatively very little across this span of time. Clearly, their lifestyle as predators of other invertebrates, utilising their fearsome looking forelimbs to capture prey and keeping themselves safe with their defence mechanisms, has proved very successful for this Carboniferous lineage. If, for some reason, there are any arachnophobes still watching, then I'm sorry to inform you that in case you didn't already know, there are also such things as whip spiders, in addition to whip scorpions. These little beasts are members of the order Amblypygi, which actually sounds quite cute, until you see what they look like. These arachnids look a bit like whip scorpions, but instead of having very long tails, they have super long whip-like front legs, which are used to sense their surroundings. Whip spiders may have also originated in the Carboniferous period, though there are even older possible fossil remains of these arachnids in the preceding Devonian period. 
Weigold tina is an example of a carboniferous aged ambipygid known from fossils uncovered in the coal measures of both Europe and North America. They lived around 315 million years ago and were similar in size to modern examples of the group, at up to 20 millimeters in total length or almost 0.8 inches. Despite living so long ago, these prehistoric arachnids are also very recognisable as whip spiders, and although a few features of their appendage anatomy have changed over time, they show many similarities to modern species. Once again it seems that this lineage of arachnids became so well suited to their predatory lifestyles and way of sensing the world back in the Carboniferous that they have not faced significant selection pressures to undergo any major anatomical changes in more than 300 million years. You may not like it, but this really is peak arachnid. The Harvest Men, or Daddy Longlegs as they're also known, are another arachnid order that was present in the Carboniferous. Technically known as the Opilionies, this is the third most diverse order of arachnids today, and they look a lot like very thin-legged spiders, but are actually not very closely related to them. Once again, the discoveries of Carboniferous members of this arachnid lineage show that they were remarkably similar in their overall body plans to modern members, suggesting that there's been a lot of stasis in their evolution. Ametikos, found in 305 million year old rocks in France, had very long second walking limbs that would have been used to sense their surroundings, like in some modern species. Ametikos was also robustly armoured for a harvestman, with a tough exoskeleton suggesting it lived on the forest floor, rather than up in the trees, where it would have to protect itself from amphibian predators. These ancient harvestmen were still relatively small though, at similar sizes to modern species. However, there's another arachnid lineage with modern representatives that got to enormous sizes back in the Carboniferous. Well, enormous in their world at least. These are the Rickenuliids, sometimes also known as the hooded tick spiders a pleasant sounding bunch. This rather poorly known group was first scientifically described based on fossils in the 1830s, a year before the first living species was discovered. Today, the Rickenuliids are all between about 5 to 10 millimeters in length, or 0.2 to 0.4 inches, and are actually blind. They lack eyes and instead use long sensory legs to tap around them to locate prey in their cave and rainforest floor habitats. But an extinct species that lived during the late Carboniferous, called Curculioides bohemundi, was a giant among Reconuliids, reaching an immense 23.6 millimeters in length, or 0.9 inches. This prehistoric species also still had eyes, so likely lived on the forest floor where vision was important to locate their smaller invertebrate prey. Modern Reconuliids that live on rainforest floors generally stay beneath the leaf litter so it seems the lifestyles of this arachnid lineage have actually changed over time. The final group we'll be looking at are the camel spiders, which rather confusingly are again not spiders, and definitely not camels. They're also known as sun spiders, though the technical name for the order is Solifugae. The Solifugues are quite fearsome looking arachnids with their large mouth parts or chelicerae, which are so strong they can apparently shear through thin bones. Today, the Solifugues inhabit desert regions on every continent except Australasia and Antarctica, and are renowned for their incredibly fast movements. They are mostly nocturnal creatures and are generalist hunters that feed on other invertebrates, but they've also been known to take on small vertebrates, including mice, lizards, and birds. Modern species can also grow concerningly large, reaching up to 15 centimeters or almost 6 inches in total length. Of course, such formidable beasts were also around during the Carboniferous, with the species Protosolpuga, discovered in the Maison Creek fossil beds in Illinois, living about 309 million years ago. This species is only about 2.5 centimeters or about an inch long as preserved, and it's not the most complete fossil, but once again it does show many of the identifiable features of modern solifugues, suggesting that this lineage had also come across peak arachnid body plan all these millions of years ago. If they were indeed much like modern camel spiders, then these prehistoric arachnids would surely have been formidable predators of the Carboniferous world, perhaps even posing a threat to some of our small early amniote ancestors. Quite terrifying to think that your very distant relatives might have once fallen prey to such things. Oh, and these are also the types of arachnids that the ones in Primeval were apparently meant to be when they invaded the London Underground great episode, although they were rather a lot larger than the fossils we have of these creatures. So, the Carboniferous should really be known as the arachnophobe's worst nightmare. This time period was incredibly important for the diversification and evolution of these fascinating animals. Those ancient coal swamps would have had some very active undergrowths filled with all kinds of predatory arachnids hunting down their prey. 
It also might be somewhat of a surprise to people to learn that, although there were certainly still some very large invertebrates around during the Carboniferous, such as Arthropleura and the griffin flies, the arachnids, and in particular the spiders, were not really as giant as some paleo media has led us to believe. A lot of that can be attributed to the misinterpretation of Megarachne, to be fair. And of course, there's still always the chance that we just haven't found those shelob sized spiders in the fossil record yet. But I still think it's pretty cool that the biggest spiders we know of are living with us today. This episode was brought to you by Curiosity Box. I'm Ben, as you probably realise from the rest of the video. These are my Seven Days of Science co hosts, Doug and Amelia. The Curiosity Box have sent us this, and we're going to have a look inside it. Uh, this is the autumn, is they call it autumn? Fall, autumn uh, for this year. It has sold out. So if you do get it, you'll be getting the next one or the previous one. But you can also get 15% off using a promo code exclusive to us. And the promo code is... Fossil. Fossil, it's fossil. fossil. Did you know that? Um, no, I did not know okay. that. Three. Two. One. One. Go. Go. <laughs> Let's get in there. The Curiosity Box the by Vsauce. Be by Vsauce. Okay, 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 that, that's spoilers. Oh, spoilers. Okay, these, <gasps> okay, okay, this okay, what's this, what's this, makeup. what's this? Makeup. Oh! Oh, wow. To get Solve the... this puzzle to remove the treasure inside and you'll be rewarded with oh. a special coin that lets you control the outcome of any flip, what's... or at least what someone else thinks is the outcome. That is cool. Oh, see that so says say that says That's tails. Really you can just prank people, and that says heads. That you is quite good. Get them to do anything you want. I don't think that's. <laughs> A, what this does, and B, a good thing. Uh, I think it's a very good thing. My only question is, how do we get it out? How do we get in? Quinn? Yeah, yeah. yeah. A t-shirt! Oh, no, 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 get out! Oh. If you crush Uranus, Uranus like... into a ball smaller than the circle on the front of this t-shirt, it will become a black hole. That's sick. Amazing. That's so cool. That's, that's how big it is, next to Ben's face. Here's Ben's face yeah. for comparison. You're basically a walking science fact, and aren't you? And that's how big your anus is. Cameraman figured it out. He did it. Oh! oh it how did you do it? What does it Flick. say? Heads or tails? Flicked it. Heads. <laughs> heads or tails? Heads and tails. No, no, heads or tails. All right, tails. Heads. How did you do that? Heads! <laughs> it was heads? <gasps> oh that's my god! It's a deck of cards! That's inside. Is it the the body, it's yeah. the body deck. The body. That's the one I wanted. <laughs> <laughs> it's so cool. Do you want to come over? Come over. It's, so cool. <laughs> it's so cool. So it's actually a sliced up person. Oh my god! Oh, so no, you it's were each bit. Me about this. Yeah, yeah. I, I genuinely wanted to buy this like on its own. <laughs> Can you do that? No. And if you get rid of the back one and hold them all perfectly straight, it looks like an actual three D person. <laughs> like, sort of That's cool. Gym. Yeah, no, oh, it yeah. does. Oh, yeah. I don't know if the That's camera will pick that so up. That's so cool. The camera probably. Oh, like, yeah. Oh, yeah, oh yeah, look wow. The face. Okay, right. Multi tool. EDC. The EDC multi tool. Oh, it's one of the metal bits. Can I pull it out? I thought oh, it'd be really thin. It's very useful that I'm here. Quinn's our expert in the curiosity <laughs> box. <laughs> yeah. He's a Vsauce's number one fan. Every single thing on that multi tool uh, is a useless value. It is a bottle opener, but it's also. Yeah, because it's uh, not even a perfect. Square. It's a yeah. not even a parallelogram. It's also Lego Lego compatible for oh, no reason. Brilliant. It has a kangaroo awareness scale. So if you spot a kangaroo, <laughs> you have left. if it uh, fits within that square or within the kangaroo symbol, you're okay. If it doesn't, you need to leave. <laughs> book, 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 book time, book time. Wait, hang on. Do you need some vampire nails? Yeah. Let's see if I can get this out. Oh. The first six books of the elements of Eus oh! Euclid. Oh! A brand new edition of Euclid's Elements, the most used mathematical textbook in human history. This is a revised edition of the legendary 1847 volume written and illustrated by Oliver Byrne. Byrne's edition had certain misprints and minor errors, which have been painstakingly sought out and corrected by an international team and presented here for published form wow. for the first time. So it's basically a really popular edition of an incredibly historically important maths book well, corrected huh? by people who know what they're talking about. Oh, this is so cute. I love this. Cool. I don't really care about the maths. I know people who would, it just but looks nice. it looks beautiful. Yeah. And I genuinely would read it like from a historical perspective. It's very interesting as well. I would flick through it to read the corrections and giggle at how someone could be so stupid without actually understanding any of the maths. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> oh my God, he didn't know it was B B6. He thought it was B5. <laughs> how could you make- What a silly fool. What a silly fool. <laughs> <laughs> 
Are they stickers? Yeah. <gasps> you get the octopus. That's I love so an cute. octopus. Give me stickers. <laughs> <laughs> I like a sticker. We we've spoiled all this edition but because if you it's sold out. You will get the next one. The mystery is on. Honestly, yeah. genuine like advice, I guess. Um, I'd recommend just opening it and seeing what's inside instead of, yeah, no, uh, of just open it up and have a look because that, that, it's it's so much fun. So rounding up, if you want to get this, all this wonderful stuff or all similarly wonderful stuff, I think it's an annual subscription. Use our link below. It helps support the channel. It means we can make stuff and we want to make loads of stuff. We want to make loads of cool, very, very good looking, high brow kind of high production. If you want this for yourself wouldn't blame you or if you want to gift it for someone else who loves science and get on for yourself and to be fair there's a fair bit of different kinds of science we had a bit of physics we had a bit of maths ma mathematics which i would count as science we had biology we had sticker science the most important kind of science kangaroos kangaroos, kangaroos. Yeah. australia that's a science use our link use, use the link uh, in the description the code the code, use, the code, use the code FOSSIL, and with the code FOSSIL you get 25% off or $15 off of the annual plan. 15 more dollars you can spend on fossils. Here's the, the link. Code. The code will be here. Here's the link. link and in the, the code. Oh, there it is. It's right there. Click it. Why is it still Magic. there? Why are you still here? Click the link. I don't know. Click the link. And a massive thank you to the curious oh, yeah. box. We had so much fun this is opening good. it up. Yeah, this is and good. now we're going to fight tooth and nail for what we want to steal. Yeah. Anyway, thank you for watching this video and thanks again to Curiosity Box for sponsoring. You get some fantastic and unique science stuff with the subscription, plus by using our link you'll be helping to support the channel. If you would like to learn more about our world, its history and the wonderful life that surrounds us all, please feel free to subscribe to the channel if you think we deserve it, and if you would like to see more from us.